Welcome back, uh, everybody. Uh, let me welcome you to the last session of this um, conference, ECB conference on monetary policy. We have the real pleasure to host Emi Nakamura, UC Berkeley, um, as our second keynote speaker of today. She is well known for her very wide ranging uh, research agenda, which spans many areas of uh, great interest for uh, scholars, for us, central bank economists, practitioners of monetary policy. In that tradition, today she will uh, speak about forecast errors, which uh, is something uh, central banks and other institutions uh, have been struggling with uh, for a year, a uh, good year now, in a big way. Uh, she proposes a very interesting interpretation for why we see all the forecasting anomalies that she documents in her presentation. I must say I find that interpretation very, <laughs> very convincing, but I won't reveal what it is. Uh, it will be uh, Emmy to do so in her presentation. So Emmy, uh, over to you. Uh, you have 50 minutes and then we'll open the floor for Q&A and for debate. Thank you very much for that very gracious introduction and um, and, uh, and 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 also for sort of build, building some mystery around my results, which I will reveal in my presentation. So this paper is um, called Learning About the Long Run. It's joint with Leland Farmer and John Steinson. So um, the paper is about uh, forecast errors. And um, as is well known, there are a variety of different kinds of forecast errors, even among professional forecasters. And these have been you know, well documented in the literature. So let me just go through a few of the facts that I think have motivated the literature and also motivate our paper. So one fact has to do with bias. So here I'm going to be talking about two leading examples. One is forecasting interest rates. That's the T-bill uh, row here. And the second is forecasting GDP growth. That's the GDP growth row here. And um, the one thing to keep in mind is that in terms of the forecast horizon, the forecast horizon for T-bill is in terms of quarters, whereas for GDP growth, this is in terms of years. And this is just because you'll see as, as we go along in the presentation that many of the most interesting forecast errors for, the, for interest rates are at shorter horizons and for, for uh, GDP growth at longer horizons. The data for interest rates um, are from the survey professional forecasts. That's where the, the interest rate forecast data come from. And for GDP growth, it's from the Congressional Budget Office. So uh, in the case um, of bias, the idea is that you could run a regression of the forecast error, where the forecast error is just given by the actual outcome of variable minus the forecast at various horizons into the future. So this would be one, two, three, four, and five quarters into the future for, for, for interest rates. And for GDP growth, it would be you know, several years into the future. And you see that for interest rates, um, over the sample period we're looking at, there has been a negative bias in forecasts. Um, for GDP growth, uh, nothing statistically significant. Another uh, anomaly that has been documented in the literature has been autocorrelated forecast errors. So this is the idea that when forecasters are off in one direction, they tend to be off repeatedly in the same direction. And of course, this is maybe an idea that we feel familiar with over the past year. Um, so if you look at, at um, interest rates, so the idea is to run a regression of the forecast error uh, at time t of, uh, of outcomes h periods ahead on the same object h periods ago. Um, so there would be different ways of, of documenting autocorrelated forecast errors, but this is one statistic like this, and you can see that uh, for interest rates, you see this um, you know, significant autocorrelation in forecast errors. Uh, in contrast, again, for GDP growth, we don't see anything statistically significant uh, for, for, for autocorrelated forecast errors. A third kind of uh, classic test of, um, of, of, these, of, of the sort of rationality of these forecasts is to look at what uh, Mincer and Zarnowitz uh, introduced in a classic paper, which is to look at the effect of a change in the forecast on outcomes at the same horizon. So the idea here is that with full information maximum likelihood, then the forecasts are just Bayesian conditional expectations. In this situation, then if, a, if the forecast moves by 1%, then the actual outcome should also move by 1%. Um, 
And so in other words, this coefficient beta should be equal to one. In this case, um, actually for interest rates, uh, even though the coefficient differs uh, statistically significantly from one. So here I want to mention that the stars reflect uh, differences from one as opposed to differences from zero. And you can see there is some statistically significant uh, difference from one. It's a little bit below one, but you can see that in economic terms, it's not that far from one. However, if we look at GDP forecasts, you see just you know, massive uh, deviations from the value of one. In fact, at a forecast horizon of three years, the coefficient is, is basically zero. So what this means is that on average, when the forecast moved by 1%, actual, unc out actual outcomes at that horizon didn't move at all. Um, now this is from the CBO, um, but uh, so this is the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, but uh, these forecasts from the Congressional Budget Office are very, very close to private sector uh, forecasts. Uh, so, um, so I think that this is a, a more general phenomenon about these forecasts. Another set of facts uh, that some of you may be thinking of as related, but are not um, usually analyzed in the same literature, are the set of facts that relate to the term structure, uh, the expectation hypothesis of interest rates. So uh, Campbell and Schiller introduced um, some sort of benchmark tests to look at tests of the expectation hypothesis. The first regression test that they looked at uh, on the right hand side puts uh, the spread between long term and short term yields and on the left hand side puts a sort of ex post spread. So here we have the yield spread on the left hand side. We have the average short term uh, interest rates minus the current short term interest rate. And it's easy to show um, that again with full information rational expectations, you would think that this coefficient beta would be equal to one. Uh, but a large literature has shown that in fact this coefficient is, is, is closer to zero than to one. And, and that's what we're documenting in this table here. Um, if you run this regression uh, at various horizons and into the future, you see you get coefficients very close to zero. So um, you know, while it should be, according to full information rational expectations, that these yield spreads strongly predict the, the trajectory of, um, of full information uh, of, of future short term interest rates. In fact, it's not the case in the data. Now, I should add one more thing. I've been playing a little bit fast and loose with, with my terminology. There is an, another important potential um, uh, gap between the predictions of full information rational expectations in this object on the left hand side, which is risk premium. But here I'm assuming that this risk premium are constant. And well, I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So, a second test of this uh, expectation hypothesis, so the idea that long-term interest rates are approximately equal to the average of future short-term interest rates plus a, a constant risk premium, is uh, looking at the change in the long-term yield on the left-hand side on the yield spread on the right-hand side. So here the intuition is a little bit more involved, but the idea is that when the yield spread is high, that means that um, if you just look at the interest rate, the return on the long-term bond would be higher than the return on the short-term bond, so to equalize returns, you actually need the yield spread on the longer term bond to rise so that the long term bond takes a capital loss and that equalizes returns between the short and the long term bond. Or another way to think about it is that, you know, with the expectation hypothesis, the long term uh, interest rate is, is just a, a weighted average of future uh, short term interest rates. And um, and in that situation, Right now, the short-term interest rate is, is low relative to the long-term interest rate. And so as you move forward one period in time, you're gonna be dropping out a relatively low value of the short-term interest rate, and that should make the average of the remaining periods rise over time. In any case, you know, these are just kind of intuitions to develop the fact that again, if you, if you look at the expectation hypothesis, the prediction is that beta would be equal to one. So when the yield spread is unusually high, this would be a time when you're expecting long-term yields to rise. But in fact, again, as a, as, as a long literature has documented, this coefficient is in fact negative. Um, so again, the null hypothesis under the expectation hypothesis is that beta would actually be equal to one. In fact, what we see in the data is that beta is minus one. So it's, it's very far from, um, from what you would get as, as the null from the expectation hypothesis. Now, there are a number of important uh, potential explanations for these anomalies relating to the expectation hypothesis. One uh, set of explanations has to do with time-varying risk premia, like I mentioned. 
A second set of explanations relates to deviations between full information rational expectations and you know, the expectations that uh, people actually have. And uh, that's the sort of line of inquiry that we're going to pursue. And that's the connection that I'm trying to develop between these term structure facts and the facts relating to anomalies in professional forecasts. So uh, an important seminal paper on this topic was by Fruit in 1989, where he pointed out that, um, that a number of the puzzles relating to uh, uncovered interest rate parity could be substantially uh, ameliorated if you were to consider survey expectations as opposed to imposing full information, max, uh, full information rational expectations, which you know, suggests that some of the locus of the problems relates to the formation of expectations. Now, um, in macroeconomics, so there's a long literature um, talking about these ideas going back, as I mentioned earlier, to Mincer and Zarnowitz, and certainly to, to Friedman's uh, work early after the sort of influx of rational expectations into macroeconomics. And one uh, traditional reaction to this set of facts is that the forecasters are irrational or are using the information in an inefficient way. And a, a recent sort of variant of this line of thinking uh, is, is the, the line of work by Bordalo, Ginaioli, Mann, Schleifer. An alternative reaction um, where there's also been a lot of work in macroeconomics is the idea that, uh, that, that these forecasters face important forms of informational rigidity and frictions. Now, this second literature sort of falls into two branches. On the one hand, um, there's important work on sticky information uh, models. In these models, uh, the key assumption is that forecasters update their information infrequently. And a second important branch of this literature relates to noisy information. So in this case, uh, the situation, the, the challenge that the forecasters face is that they don't observe uh, a completely clean um, data on, on, on the variables that they're interested in. So they get a noisy signal of the variables they're interested in. Now, while we find these explanations uh, entirely plausible for, for explaining many facts in, in macroeconomics, particularly relating to households and firms, they seem less plausible for the case of professional forecasters. Um, in all my interactions with professional forecasters, my uh, strong impression has been that they are um, very uh, up to date on the latest announcements by the Fed and the ECB and so on. So they're not using old information about macroeconomic variables. And of course, they know exactly what the Fed funds rate is or, or the, the, the other policy rates uh, that, that we face in the world. So these seem like less plausible um, explanations for the specific case of professional forecasters. And in addition to that, typically the professional forecasters know exactly what each other's forecasts are and are sort of intensely aware of where they lie in that distribution. But even if these particular information frictions may be less important for the case of professional forecasters, it doesn't mean that full information rational expectations isn't making a strong set of assumptions. Because in particular, uh, this, this set of assumptions implies that the forecasters in the model really know the model that is generating the data. They know the model and they know the parameters. And I think that the last 18 months you know, has made all of us feel uh, like, like this is a strong assumption. Like it's a strong assumption to say that we know the model and we know the parameters. And it seems more realistic to assume that just like us, the forecasters in the model are learning about the model that generates the data. But once you introduce parameter learning, even into a model with rational expectations, then uh, it actually fundamentally changes the dynamics of the model and it can lead standard rational expectations tests to fail. This has been a point, again, that in a qualitative sense, at least, has been made going all the way back to Benjamin Friedman's early work on this topic. And I'm listing a number of important papers that have, have also made this point. So given um, that this is an idea that has been out there, you know, that you know, we don't know the model, we don't know the parameters in real time, and we're learning, um, and that, in fact, this is something that can uh, change the interpretation of failures of rational expectations tests, why isn't, um, why isn't this um, sort of the standard interpretation in literature? So, um, so let me just read a, a very nice, I think, quote that, that summarizes um, you know, the intuition for, for this idea that, uh, that maybe people don't know the model in real time by Anna Cheeslock's paper in 2018. She writes, ex post predictability of forecast errors did not imply that people make obvious mistakes that could be easily fixed in real time, even when conducting a quasi real time estimation, an econometrician uses ex post knowledge of a statistical relationship 
that would have been much harder to uncover in real time. Okay, so this is the idea that maybe it's hard to figure these things out in real time. And as I said, this seems like a plausible idea. So, so why is this not a more prominent interpretation in the literature? Well, I think uh, that one major issue is that once you start to introduce parameter uncertainty into the model, the models often become much harder to solve. In particular, um, if you allow not just for you know, transitory states uh, to, be, to be what people are learning about, but also these persistent parameters. And as a consequence of this, to sort of get closed form solutions and more tractable models, a lot of the earlier work on parameter learning used relatively simple models. Um, and in these models, uh, there's sort of a folk theorem that the Bayesian learning tends to be relatively fast. And so the question remains whether this kind of a learning explanation could really explain anomalies that persist over long periods of time. The anomalies that I showed you at the beginning have actually persisted over decades. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, can this type of learning explanation actually lead to uh, persistent anomalies over, over, over that kind of time horizon? Or would it be something that we would expect to see disappear over just a few years? Uh, there, there is um, an informal discussion in a number of papers that suggests, you know, that, that makes the argument that perhaps in some form, parameter breaks might sustain learning over longer periods of time. But it's been hard to formalize um, this idea of parameter breaks. And so I think it's, it's, it's reasonable to, to, to say that the question is sort of still out there, whether in a model um, with, uh, with, with rational expectations, you could actually have this kind of learning sustaining, uh, sustaining anomalies over long periods of time. At the same time, I think it's been increasingly realized in people's thinking related to the term structure that you actually need to have a somewhat com more complicated model to understand interest rate dynamics. So in particular, I think it has been pretty well established that you need to have some kind of a shifting endpoints model of, of, of the type that was suggested by Kozicki and Tinsley, where people are changing their views about where interest rates are going in the longer run uh, to, to understand the behavior of interest rates. And there are very similar issues that arise uh, in the case of GDP. So the question is, where do we think growth is going in the longer run? And these are questions that, um, you know, there's people's views have changed over time, you know, for example, in the era of secular, secular stagnation and so on. Uh, and that's an important component of, of how the forecasts are changing. But the challenge is that once you introduce these kinds of forces, you're thinking about an unobserved components model where there are multiple components of the interest rate or of GDP growth. And this deep component that has to do with long-term interest rate expectations or long-term growth expectations is not directly observable. In that kind of model, the parameters uh, can be very difficult to learn. And the basic intuition is that the model can yield fairly similar fit to high frequency behavior which is the data that you're you know, getting all the time if you're the agent in the model. But at the same time, they can, can, can yield very different implications for low frequency behavior. So intuitively, you know, if you look at um, you know, an un unobserved component that has a AR1 coefficient of 0.9, that might have fairly high, a fairly similar high frequency implications to uh, a model that had this, this, uh, this component having a, a persistence of one. But if you look at the longer run implications, they might be very different. So in this setting, um, we're going to show that Bayesian learning can, in fact, be very slow. And again, this, this follows up on uh, other recent work sort of making related points. So what we're going to do very concretely is to look at the two applications that I presented um, the facts about, survey, about professional forecasters at the beginning. Uh, so forecasting interest rates and forecasting GDP growth. And we're going to be thinking about exactly the set of facts that I presented at the beginning. Um, the model is uh, going to be very simple conceptually. We're going to think about uh, Bayesian forecasters. We endow them with an unobserved components model and initial beliefs about the parameters. Then we feed them the data on interest rates and GDP in real time, and we have them generate real-time forecasts. And then the question is going to be whether we um, are able to match the uh, anomalies in the data using this model. Uh, and then at the end, so this, this analysis will all be using actual data on GDP and interest rates. At the end, I'll also do a Monte Carlo uh, simulation where I'm actually simulating uh, the interest rate data from the model and then applying the learning model to that simulated data. And that's 
useful because um, in, in, that, in that Monte Carlo, we actually know that the data is, is truly coming from the model that we propose. So the main result is going to be that we can actually match the forecasting anomalies that I showed you um, when the forecasters are endowed with reasonable initial beliefs. Of course, the, the question is what reasonable is, but um, I'll show you the, the priors and, and the argument we're making is just that these are fairly dispersed um, initial beliefs. Uh, so they're not point masses where um, the individual you know, couldn't be convinced of a different view, but they're fairly dispersed initial beliefs. And nevertheless, uh, there can be quite persistent anomalies. So the main uh, interpretation that, that we come to of these forecasting anomalies is that in a situation where the low frequency phenomena are hard to learn about, then learning can generate very persistent forecasting anomalies. And rational expectation tests can in fact be quite misleading even over um, pretty long periods of time. Okay, let me start with this interest rate forecasting example. Um, the data that we're using are data on the short-term interest rate from it's the three month T bill rate over the period 1951 to 2019. Um, we started in 1951 because we view this as a, a major sort of change in monetary policy after the Treasury Accord. We're going to use zero coupon yield curve data from Liu and Wu um, starting in 1961. And then we're going to use forecasts from the Survey of Professional Forecasters, which start in 1981. And they're asked to produce now casts and forecasts up to four quarters in the future. So here's a, a picture for the United States that um, many of you will be familiar with. Of course, there are related pictures for many other countries in the world. Um, the U.S. saw a sustained run-up of uh, interest rates uh, until a peak in 1980. Then, you know, Paul Volcker came into office. There was a major change in monetary policy and interest rates and inflation have been falling since then. Here's another picture that many of you may be familiar with, and I think gives you some intuition about the forecasting anomalies that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. This picture, uh, which some people refer to as the hair plot or the hairy caterpillar plot, it shows um, forecasts of interest rates uh, starting at each point in time, going back to around 1980. Um, so each dot is representing the forecast at a given uh, quarter into the future. And so you can see sort of intuitively what is causing, for example, the autocorrelated forecast errors. What is causing the autocorrelated forecast errors is, um, for example, um, during the early 2000s, the Fed is lowering interest rates, but repeatedly the bond market sort of expects that things are going to go back to normal. And they don't go back to normal, you know, or at least they don't go back to normal for a much longer time period than the bond market thinks. And the same thing happened during the Great Recession. So you see that the Fed lowered interest rates in a sustained way and then, of course, kept them at zero for a long period of time. But all, all the way through this episode, uh, repeatedly, the bond market was uh, forecasting um, that interest rates were going to go back up to some normal level. Um, and, 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 and the same was, was true of, these are, these are professional forecasts from the survey professional forecasters. So you see that there was this persistent expectation that we were gonna go back to normal. So our model for short-term interest rates um, is, uh, is very simple. It's a three parameter model. Um, and the idea is going to be that, that the T-bill yield will be a sum of two components. There's going to be a random walk component mu, and then a transitory component x. And the, the three parameters will be um, gamma, um, which is the variance share of the permanent component. So you can see that gamma enters um, on, the, on the error term in the expression for, a, for, for mu and for x. Rho, which is the persistence of the transitory component, and sigma, which is the volatility of the sh of the short of the short yield, so the the most important parameters to think about here are going to be rho and gamma. So, as rho gets higher, this is going to make the transitory component uh, a larger fraction. Sorry, it's it's going to make the transitory component more persistent, and as gamma gets higher, it's going to make the variance share of the persistent component larger. And so, one of the identification problems that the agents in this model are going to have to grapple with is um, you know, if they see what they think look like persistent interest rates, how much is it that 
rho is high, this transitory component has a very high persistence, and how much it is, is it that there's a high variance share of the permanent component? And the reason these things uh, matter is because, um, you know, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, while, um, while a row of 0.9 might look pretty similar to a unit root over short, uh, short time horizons, over longer time horizons, a unit root is going to look very different uh, from, from a transitory component with, with a row of, of 0.9. So that's going to be an important challenge that these agents are facing in trying to estimate the model. So uh, the, the exercise we do is very um, conceptually simple. We feed the agents uh, the, the actual data on interest rates in real time. We start with a set of initial beliefs in 1951, and then in every time period, we give the agents uh, a new uh, observation. Then we re-estimate the whole model, and we use uh, the posterior densities for these parameters and the states to produce uh, forecasts up to 10 years into the future. Um, and then we, we then in turn use that to create estimates of the long yield through the expectation hypothesis. One shortcut that we take um, is that we turn off parameter learning during the ZLD period. This is because um, you know, it basically allows us to stay in the, in, in the domain of a linear model. So one important idea uh, to think about in the context of our model is that um, learning is gonna be slow. Um, so I'll tell you that at the outset. Uh, so as a consequence, the initial beliefs of the forecasters will matter. And an important question is going to be not just whether we can match the anomalies for some value of the initial beliefs of the forecasters, but whether we can actually choose uh, reasonable or reasonably dispersed values of these initial beliefs. Because this interpretation is going to be much more interesting if, um, you know, if we can sort of explain what happened with reasonably dispersed initial beliefs than if we were assuming, say, a point mass uh, distribution on, on one of the priors. So the exercise that we're going to do is that we're going to try to minimize the sum of the squared deviations between the model and the data regression. So we're going to do these simulations, we're going to estimate the regressions, and then we're going to minimize the sum of the squared, squared deviations between the model regression and the data regressions while searching over a space of initial beliefs. And the space of initial beliefs is going to be um, determined by these two priors. So these are going to be priors over rho and gamma. It turns out that you know, sigma squared isn't so important for the, the facts we're explaining. So we, we fix the parameters of the prior for sigma squared. But we search over the space of initial beliefs of rho and gamma. And uh, we're, we're looking over these four parameters, the mean, the variance um, of of, of, the, of the distribution of rho and gamma. And remember, rho is the persistence of the transitory component in our model, and gamma is the fraction of the variation associated with uh, the, random, the random walk component. So the question is going to be, can we find initial beliefs for rho and gamma, which will sort of rationalize the set of anomalies that we see in the data um, when we sort of constrain ourselves to say, that the agents in the model are otherwise updating in a Bayesian manner? And the answer is that, uh, is that we can. So um, I'll show you the, the priors in, in a moment, and you can sort of think about whether you think that these initial beliefs are reasonable. But let me first show you the results in terms of uh, the forecast that these agents actually have. So here I'm showing you the same picture I showed you before uh, for the forecast going out four quarters. And, uh, and the model, and you can see, um, you know, there are a lot, you know, there are a bunch of wiggles that the, that, the, that the model is not able to fit. However, the model does fit, you know, a number of these sort of salient facts relating to, um, relating to autocorrelated forecast errors. So, you know, if you look, uh, for example, during this episode I discussed in the 2000s, you see that, that in the model, just as in the data, there's this sort of tendency to repeatedly think that things are going back to normal when in fact, um, when in fact the variation is much more persistent than people expect it to be. And the same is true during the Great Recession. That just like in the, in the data, in the model, there's this repeated view of the, the agents in the model that, that interest rates are, are going to sort of mean revert and this doesn't happen for a very long time. Now, to give you a sense of some of the variation that our model doesn't fit, um, during the, the zero lower bound period in the United States, at some point, the uh, Fed starts to use forward guidance. And then the, the, uh, 
the interest rate expectations really completely collapse to zero. And that's something that our model is not going to fit because the only information, and you know, this is clearly a simplifying assumption, the only information that we're giving the agents in our model is actually just you know, the most recent interest rate data. And so that we're not gonna capture the consequences of something like forward guidance. So um, I'm not gonna you know, go through this in great detail, but the basic finding is that we can fit the various regression tests that I showed you at the beginning. So there's a negative bias um, in the interest rates, just like in the model auto-correlated forecast errors in, uh, in, in the model, um, just as in the data. Um, the mincer zarnowitz uh, test, remember for interest rates, the coefficient on the forecast was a little bit less than one, and that's true in the model as in the data. And then we look at one additional test, which is this, um, this test uh, developed by my colleague, Yuri Gronachenko and Oli Koibian. So here they're looking at the a regression of the forecast error on the left-hand side on the updates in forecast on the right-hand side. And the question is, when forecasts are being updated in the upward direction, uh, does that tend to still be associated with um, you know, an underestimate? So when this coefficient is positive, it means that even though the forecasters are updating upward, they're still too low uh, and the forecaster is still positive. And, and they describe this as underreaction. So this is actually something we see for interest rates in the data. And, um, and, and we, we, we can also generate this in the model. Now, um, thinking about um, the interest rate facts. Um, so the first fact from the, the first Campbell and Schiller regression was that looking at the sort of ex post yield running regression on the yield spread, you see a positive coefficient, um, but it's very close to zero. I guess you see actually negative coefficient at the, at the shortest horizons. But it's, it's very close to zero. The, the null hypothesis under the expectation hypothesis is that this would be equal to one. But you see that in fact in the data, it's closer to zero than to one. That's something that our model can replicate. The second Campbell and Schiller regression, again, the null hypothesis under the expectation hypothesis is that beta equals one. But in the data, the coefficient is actually around minus one. And that's again something we replicate in the model. Um, are the initial beliefs that are required to generate these results reasonable? Uh, that's a little bit in the eye of the beholder, but I think we would argue that they are reasonably dispersed. Um, so here's the uh, distribution that, that we're using based on um, you know, these hyperparameters in terms of the distribution of, of rho and gamma that we, we estimate to fit the anomalies. So this rho here is, is sort of centered around um, you know, a level between 0.7 and 0.8. Um, and here's the, the gamma parameter here. You know, the rope does put you know, substantial mass on, on values that are you know, close to a unit root and also you know, with significantly lower persistence. If you think about it in terms of half-lives, this would span a pretty wide range. What is the intuition for these uh, results? Um, well, one way of thinking about it for the interest rate case is that it looks like over time, if you look at the row estimates, that there's sort of a gradual drift upward in how persistent the agents in the model think these interest rate movements are. So, you know, relative to their prior, which, you know, is, puts quite a bit of weight on, on you know, relatively stationary values over time, uh, the agents start to believe in, in more persistence of these interest rate fluctuations. And I'll come back to this in our, in our uh, Monte Carlo analysis, but I think that's one central intuition that, that the priors uh, that they start with um, in, um, in, in 1960 actually put, put too little weight on, on very persistent movements in the interest rate. Uh, now, this is the, the, the estimates of the state variable. You can see these move around a lot um, and sort of reflect the idea that they, they rise dramatically around 1980 and then fall thereafter. Uh, now, what would be the intuition for why um, agents could be wrong in this particular way? Well, I think Fama in a 2006 paper has a nice quote that relates to this. Um, he says, there was little prior experience with a fiduciary currency when the right to exchange currency for gold was discontinued in 1971. And it is reasonable that the high inflation and interest rates that followed were a surprise. The experience led market participants to rationally predict that a fiduciary currency, a currency that is not backed by a commodity like gold, implied permanently higher expected inflation. Um, in other words, the preceding positive shocks to expected inflation were judged to be permanent. It turns out, however, that the Federal Reserve won a long odds game and they learned how to ma manage a fiduciary currency. So the, 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 the argument he's making here 
is that perhaps one of the things that was influencing people's beliefs about interest rates was that for most of history, um, people had been on a gold standard. And in the gold standard, in fact, interest rate movements are a lot more transitory. And so perhaps some of what happened um, subsequently, where we saw these much more persistent movements in interest rates was surprising relative to this long history uh, of countries being on a gold standard with much uh, less persistent interest rate movements. Uh, in the paper, we do some initial analysis, uh, additional analysis that sort of um, considers, for example, a break in monetary policy in 1990, because we know, you know, there was a major change in monetary policy associated with Volcker, and we're able to fit some additional facts uh, related to finance. But let me, uh, let me spend a few minutes talking about our output growth forecasting analysis. Um, this is going to be very sort of uh, easy to follow given what I've already said about the interest rate, because we're going to do a very similar exercise, but this time for GDP growth as opposed to interest rates. So the data now are from the Philadelphia Fed's real-time data set, and the forecasts are from the Congressional Budget Office. Um, an appealing thing about these forecasts is just that they go out five years, but, but in fact, they're very similar to other professional forecasters. So here's the same kind of hair plot or, or whisker plot that I showed you for interest rates, but this time for GDP forecasts. Um, so again, the, 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 and, and now with the one additional complication that there's an issue of different vintages of data, but the, um, the dashed lines, the dashed black line is showing you the initial uh, release. And then at each point in time, these gray lines are showing you what the forecasts were um, going out uh, forward in time. Um, and so you can see some of the major challenges um, that have been faced by the CBO and other professional forecasters on growth. So look at the late 1990s. So during this period of time, um, actual growth, you know, and the initial release of actual growth was, was very high, um, you know, in the, in the fours. Um, and there was this repeated expectation, as you can see from the, the gray line, that growth was going to go back to normal. Um, and it wasn't until sort of the very end that the CBO, you know, the, the early 2000s, that the CBO finally started to predict that this, these, this, this high growth that we were seeing in the late 1990s was actually going to persist. Uh, but unfortunately, almost right around the time that they, that they switched from, from believing that this was going to be transitory to believing it was going to persist, uh, it was over. You know, there was the dot-com um, crash and, and, in fact, growth fell. So there you see, you know, again, um, an intuition for why there can be these autocorrelated forecast errors. Uh, the model that we are using is uh, just slightly more complicated than the model we used in the interest rate case. Um, output is going to have, have uh, two components. Um, so there's going to be, again, a random walk component and, uh, and a transitory component. And uh, it's going to be a random walk with drift, because of course there's positive um, you know, growth on average. And the transitory component is going to be an AR2, and that's to replicate some of the hump-shaped dynamics that we see in GDP. But still, it's, um, you know, it's, it's only a five-parameter model, um, and so it's, you know, it's still a relatively parsimonious model of, of GDP. So we do the same exercise as before. Um, so we're going to ask uh, what initial beliefs would you have to have on these parameters uh, to be able to fit the anomalies that we see in the data. And we, we are actually able to fit a number of these anomalies. I would say that the fit of this model to the anomalies is uh, not quite as good as in the case of the interest rate data, but still we're able to fit a number of the salient facts. So in particular, if you look at that episode I was just describing to you, in the late 1990s where growth was very high and repeatedly the CBO kept thinking it would go back to normal, you know, we see the same kind of dynamics um, in, in our model. Um, and, and remember, you know, in our model, these are Bayesian forecasters. They're forced to be, you know, Bayesian, at least conditional on the model that we give them. Uh, the most interesting anomaly for the GDP forecasts was the mincer zarnowitz regression. You might remember that the mincer zarnowitz regression had this distressing feature that if you looked three years out, if you're running a regression of actual output growth on the forecast um, for, that, for that point in time, for three, three years out, the coefficient is actually zero. So a 1% increase in, in the forecast was, was actually equal, associated with, with no increase at all in actual outcomes. And, uh, and this, this general pattern is something that we're able to 
replicate in the data. So we don't quite get zero here, but there's this strong downward slope. And in fact, we're able to get to this very um, counterintuitive kind of result that the coefficient is actually negative at longer horizons, which mean that, means that a higher forecast is actually associated with, um, with lower actual outcomes. Uh, and, and we're also able to fit a number of these other anomalies that I showed you at the beginning. Um, so, for example, the Koibion and Grodinchenko statistic. Um, for the case of output, in fact, the coefficient here flips. Uh, for interest rates, it was mildly positive, so that, um, in their language, is associated with underreaction of the forecast. For output, um, at longer horizons, the coefficient is negative, which in their language is associated with overreaction. So the the forecasts are being updated up, and that's associated with um, a forecast error that's negative. So they updated too much up, and we're, we're able to fit this uh, qualitatively. So what, um, what initial beliefs do we need uh, to fit these facts? These are a little bit harder to interpret because AR2s are harder to interpret than AR1s. Um, but again, so row one plus row two is, um, I think, one measure of the persistence of the, the transitory component in the GDP growth um, model. And, and you see that again, like from a half-life standpoint, we're putting weight on um, a, a pretty wide range of different half-lives. And so, you know, these are certainly not uh, uniform priors, and I, I want to emphasize this. The, the fact that they're informative priors is playing an important role in why we're able to fit these facts, but at the same time, they're, they're, it's not a situation where we're, we're putting a point mass on particular strong beliefs about these parameters. So the uh, last thing I want to talk about is this Monte Carlo, sort of, which gives some insight into why it is that we get these results. So here what we're going to do is simulate data from the interest rate model, and we're going to consider um, three different versions of the truth relative to the initial beliefs. So in the first version, uh, we're going to think about a case where the initial beliefs are unbiased in the sense that they're centered on the truth. So this is actually still not full, in, full information rational expectations because um, it's not that the, that the forecasters literally know the parameters. They know some uh, distribution around the correct parameters, but they're centered in the right place. And, and it's going to turn out that even though this isn't quite full information rational expectations, all these rational expectation tests are going to work in that case. The second um, setting we're going to think about is a case of downward biased um, initial beliefs. So here, um, you know, we're going to have the same truth, but the initial beliefs are going to be centered around values of persistence, which are too low. So this is related to the quote I described about the gold standard, you know, the idea that maybe coming into the Volcker period, people just didn't anticipate how persistent these movements in interest rates and so on could be. And then the third um, example, we're going to flip things and think about a case where um, the initial beliefs are upward biased relative to the truth. And here, because the so the truth here, we're, we're choosing something similar to the final posterior means of our parameters, and it, it is actually relatively persistent. So to create this case with upward biased initial beliefs, we actually are going to change the truth to make the truth uh, much more uh, transitory. So here's sort of a visual description of this. Um, the, the gray line is, is the truth, and the black is the, is the prior, the initial beliefs. And so in the unbiased case, the uh, initial beliefs are centered around the truth, although there's still some uncertainty. In the downward biased case, the initial beliefs are, you know, imply a lot less persistence than the truth. And in the upward biased case, the initial beliefs imply um, much less persistence um, than the truth. Sorry, did I get that wrong? In the downward bias case, the initial beliefs, belie uh, beliefs imply much less persistence than the truth. And in the, and the upward bias case, the initial beliefs imply much more persistence than the truth. So um, what we see from this Monte Carlo analysis is that in the case of unbiased initial beliefs, we basically get back the full information rational expectations results. So um, here I'm looking at the autocorrelation forecast errors. The null hypothesis under full information rational expectations would be beta equals zero. And in fact, we find essentially the beta equals zero. But in contrast, um, if we assume these downward biased initial beliefs, 
uh, people, uh, people's uh, initial beliefs are that rho implies much less persistence than actually turns out to be in the data, then we can generate autocorrelated forecast errors of the kind that we see in, in the data. And in contrast, if we, if we flip things and we say, what if people uh, thought things were going to be much more persistent, but, but actually they turn out to be very transitory, then we actually get negatively autocorrelated forecast errors. And we see the same thing for the various different statistics we have analyzed. So for the interest rate case, um, this Koibion and Gradnichenko um, coefficient for underreaction or overreaction, for the unbiased initial beliefs case, we get zero, as in full information and rational expectations. For the downward bi biased initial beliefs, we get a slightly positive number, so that's underreaction. And for the upward biased initial beliefs, we get a negative number, which is overreaction. And similarly, for the, the uh, various tests of the expectation hypothesis, um, remember that the null hypothesis here would be beta equals one. For the unbiased initial beliefs case, we basically replicate beta equals one. For the downward biased initial beliefs case, we get a number close to zero, like in the data. And for the upward biased initial beliefs case, we get a number much higher than one. For the second expectation hypothesis uh, test, again, the null hypothesis is one, and that's basically what we get for the unbiased initial beliefs case. For the downward biased initial beliefs case, we get a number close to minus one, like in the, like in the data. And for the upward biased initial beliefs case, we get a number much higher than one. So in this sense, um, you know, we're able to kind of, one way of thinking about this is sort of as data reduction. We're able to see these different facts uh, through a sort of unified uh, lens um, that if you have these, these uh, initial beliefs that are biased relative to what actually turns out to be true, um, then you can get all of these anomalies. One more piece of intuition here. In this uh, Monte Carlo, we can ask the question, how long does it actually take for people to, to learn the truth? And it turns out that it, it just takes a very long time in this kind of model. So um, here is the here is the simulation um, showing rho between 0.9 and 1. And you see that you know, there's learning going in the direction of, um, of the truth, but even over many decades, you're still, uh, you know, there's still a gap between the actual uh, you know, in, in the model of what these Bayesian agents believe about rho and what it actually is. And the same thing for gamma. And a lot of this um, has to do with um, this unobserved component structure. So if we turn off um, updating about gamma, so now there's no more unobserved components uh, structure, now there's just one component um, of, of, of the interest rate model, now the learning occurs much more rapidly. That's what I'm showing in this dashed line, and you see that convergence toward the true you know, beliefs about, about rho happens much more rapidly than in our model, which has updating about both of these unobserved components. So let me, let me stop there. Um, the basic argument we make is that um, these forecast anomalies um, can be explained um, by slow learning in a model where um, there, there, there's this unobserved components uh, structure and there's some important degree of uncertainty about uh, the long run. And that's why we called the, the, the paper learning about the long run, because, you know, it's not that we're trying to argue that, that, that it would always be the case that you could explain uh, failures of rational expectations using this type of story but rather that this would potentially matter in situations where there's a significant amount of uncertainty about where things are going in the long run, but our sense is that the interest rate case and the GDP growth case are both cases uh, where there is a lot of that kind of uncertainty. And we're looking at the historical data, you know, shows you these large um, secular shifts uh, that it would be reasonable for forecasters to worry about going forward. Okay, let me stop there and, and, and uh, take some questions. Um, Give some time. Uh, fascinating presentation, Emmy. Thank you. Uh, you have already a couple of questions. So yeah. one question has two parts to it. Let me read uh, read out the first part, and then maybe you you can already react, and then we go to the to the second one. Romer and Romer, two thousand and two thousand AER, demonstrate that the Federal Reserve has considerable information about macroeconomic variables, but, uh, for example, inflation, beyond what is known to professional forecasters. Do you find that this is still the case? If yes, would it be op optimal for central banks to release this information? That, that's so, Carlo. So, 
so I don't think that our results um, particularly speak to that question. Um, so I guess that the, the, the forecasts that we're using for GDP growth are from the Congressional Budget Office. So that's an arm of the government, of course, not quite the Fed. Um, over short horizons, those forecasts are actually very similar to private sector forecasts. Um, there, there might be some small differences, but I think they're, they're relatively small. Uh, so I don't think our, um, our results directly speak to that issue. However, I would say as a more general um, matter, I think this is a very interesting question. I've, I've myself done other work on this question of the, the Fed information um, effect, and I think, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an area that should be explored more. Okay, so let me move to the second part for GDP forecast. As you have shown, data revisions are very big due to uh, benchmark revisions by st statistical agencies or advances in, in economic techniques. The difference between forecasting anomalies for GDP and inflation where there is no data uncertainty could give a dimension of data uncertainty. And that's, that's a question mark. Um, yes. So, uh, in, so, of course, for interest rates, there isn't this um, updating, as, as you mentioned, but for GDP, there is. And this is why we're using this real-time uh, data. So, the information that the agents in our model are receiving is the um, initial release of GDP. But in my graphs, you could see, just, as, just, just like you're saying, that there's often quite a large gap between um, the initial release and uh, the final release. And I think that's, that's an important issue as well. And very important in understanding the forecast. Like if you looked at these um, hair plots that I had, you would be completely confused <laughs> if you were looking at the, up, at the, at the updated uh, statistics. But they make sense in the context of, of the statistics people had at the time. Okay, uh, there's another one from Sarah Holton. In general, professional forecasters are better in forecasting inflation and GDP than interest rates, especially long-term interest rates. Would this mean that the ultimate drivers of the forecast anomalies are different? I'm not sure. Um, so I think so we're arguing that, um, you know, regardless sort of of the overall level of, of failures on these two, and, you know, that clearly has to do with um, the amount of persistence to, to some extent, uh, that there could be common factors that are important for both, that, um, that if there's this, I mean, most importantly, we're arguing that if there's this long run component, which you know, has been emphasized in the case of, of interest rates, and I think also in GDP growth, that, you know, the question is, where are interest rates going in the long run? Is, is there going to be a secular decline in interest rates? Is there going to be a secular decline in growth? That, um, that changing views about that question will affect forecast errors, you know, and it might, like, for example, if you look at the last year, it might take some time for people to become convinced that the inflation is, is really persistent. Um, and that kind of learning can uh, play an important role in the forecast errors. Thank you. Uh, last question. Great presentation. So that's the first exclamation. The econometric literature has uh, come up with a test that identified the horizon as of which model forecasts essentially become completely uninformative. For some variables, that horizon is found to be fairly short. Can your framework say something on when those horizons are reached, i.e. when uh, forecasting based on models doesn't really make sense anymore? It's a good question. I, I, I will have to think about that. Or, I mean, in our model, um, I think the main message would be that so, so you look at those CBO forecasts and you, you see that sort of disturbing result that if you look five years out, um, you know, you see a zero coefficient on the forecast if you're running regression actual outcomes on the forecast. And, and, and you, you ask yourself, like, does that imply that the CBO is doing something wrong? And, and actually, I think one of the, the consequences of, of our analysis that is that no, it doesn't necessarily imply that the CBO is doing something wrong because even a Bayesian agent, you know, facing a world in which they just don't know the parameters and are learning about the parameters could actually um, 
generate data that, that look like that, where they're actually using all of the information efficiently, but they just, you know, they're just wrong about something in the sense that their prior was centered on the wrong place. And, and, and so as a consequence, um, as a consequence, uh, they didn't have unbiased priors uh, ex post. But of course, ex ante, I mean, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. How, how do you know where to put your initial beliefs if you haven't seen the future yet? So I actually think that in certain ways, our, um, our results are sort of a defense against, um, against mistakes uh, that are made, even when they look persistent ex post, um, that, you know, they could be a consequence um, of, of an agent that, that, that actually is using the information efficiently. Now, one question you might ask in which we asked ourselves is, would it be better to just have a completely agnostic prior, like a flat prior? Would that work better? And an interesting sort of fact is, is that actually it, it, it doesn't work better from a forecasting standpoint. So we have done some analysis of, you know, in, in, our, in our model, in some sense, the anomalies, some of the anomalies come from the fact that there are these informative priors. What if you used uh, flat priors, but one thing that, you know, will probably be um, unsurprising to those of you who are forecasters is that using flat priors is very problematic too, just because of all the overfitting problems. Um, so there's a sort of logic from a forecasting perspective that you want to shrink towards some values of the parameters, even if you don't know they're right ex ante. Um, but then when you do that, you, you can actually lead to these, uh, you know, to this evidence of bias. And I think one of the sort of consequences of our analysis is to say that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not using information in, in, in an inefficient way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emmy, very much for, um, for your presentation. Very, very well received by everybody. And uh, let me uh, close the session and the conference uh, at, the, at this point. Uh, on behalf of DCB, uh, I would like to thank warmly all the speakers uh, for their contributions, all the participants, for the questions uh, and debate, and the organizers specifically for putting together a terrific uh, conference from which we all learned, at least I learned a lot. Thanks a lot and uh, see you next year.